What's going on, Facebook people? We are live on Facebook right now. My name is Justin Cook. I'm a partner at a company called Empire Flippers. I'm here with my business partner, Joe Magnani, and we're here today to talk about exiting a very large dropshipping or e-commerce business. We've got the dropship expert with us today. His name's Anton over at Dropship Lifestyle. Anton, what's going on, buddy? Not much, not much. <laughs> yeah, we've got the logo, so we know yeah. exactly where you're from. We've got logo jealousy right now. Yeah. We got this crazy painting behind us. Uh, buddy, so how did we how did we first hear about you? How did you first hear about us? What's the story there? Yeah, yeah the first conversation I had with you guys was with Joe. And he, uh, he found me back in the Warrior Forum days when uh, I first started like talking about e-commerce, I guess. So maybe 2011, 2010. Uh, it was back in the day, back then. And uh, I actually knew who you guys were, which was funny because I had followed you while you were doing uh, uh, AdSense flippers. Got, a, I think, a private message or an email from Joe saying he wanted to talk about e-commerce and talk about how maybe you could transition some of your AdSense sites to be you know, dropship sites to like, increase the margins a little bit. And I remember we got on a call. You were in Southeast Asia at the time. I was, yep. uh, I was living in North Carolina, but I'm from New York, so we were talking about the Jets. And uh, yeah, we just talked business for a bit. And that was before I moved to Asia, and I guess we all became you know, buddies out there. But yeah, a long time ago. That's crazy. It's like six years ago, yeah. The, the unfortunate New York Jets, but yes. Uh, <laughs> anyway, yeah, I remember that very well. I was trying to come up with a system to build dropship sites because I thought maybe we had the staff in the Philippines. And it was something we could do. And you had that. So I was very interested in taking your course and looking into it. And when I saw the content, I was very impressed. Yeah, I mean, one of the things is you you built out a course on dropshipping, but you'd done it for years. So you'd built, you know, six-figure, even five-figure, six-figure, and I think seven-figure dropshipping businesses kind of on your own. You'd done it. I remember I did dropshipping back in the day. I did it like uh, I made a thousand bucks a month. I didn't actually think of it as this like massive business. And that's something you turned it into through your stores. And then you basically create this course on drops. I think you start off, it was, it was cheap. It was like a hundred, under hundred bucks or something. That's and then over seven. time you kind of raised the price. You kept adding value to it and it really resonated with people. So that's one of the reasons we want to talk to you is when it comes to drop shipping, we view you as the expert. And when it comes to selling drop shipping sites, I mean, that's something we've done not, but we've sold maybe 50 plus e-commerce businesses, including drop shipping businesses. Many of them are your course, Anton. So I thought it'd be great to have you on and for us to kind of like run through this. Yeah. Um, let's let's talk a little bit about where you're at right now. Like you, you used to be out with us in Saigon. I know we had some kind of crazy late night uh, conversation, the business chats in Saigon before. Where are you at right now? What's, what, are you, what are you working on? Yeah, yeah, I was, in, uh, I was in Saigon for a few years, Chiang Mai for like a year before that. Now I'm in, uh, in Austin. So came back to the States and we set up shop here in Texas. So. Uh, a little bit more of a home base, and I apologize. I'm turning my volume down. Got a little bit of an echo. But, uh, yeah, came out here, and, uh, you know, we basically came here to get an office. I had a coffee shop that I rented out in, uh, in Vietnam, and it ended up being, like, six people from the States that I hired to come out, and, you know, we were working together, and it got to be, like, ridiculous, like, with no business license or anything, and I wasn't doing the remote thing. I actually had, you know, a workplace we would all go to. So got a little paranoid, also wanted to scale. So we came back and now we're in Austin. Yeah. It's funny. Like I, I, I would be so against that right now. And you and I have talked about this before. That just sounds miserable to me. Aside from the logo, yeah. which I like, like so the fact of going to the office and having a team work in the office every day just sounds terrible. And I know you, and I know that like, that's not necessarily doesn't sound amazing to you either, but you, I, is, is it fair to say you're making a sacrifice to make this happen? hundred percent. Hundred percent, and that was actually the plan. And I discussed this with the team because most of the people came back with me to the states, and it was basically like, "Listen, like you know, we're not. I'm not planning on going to Austin. We're not all going to buy houses, have families, and stay there for thirty years and grow this, you know, corporate office." It was like, "Listen, there's an opportunity right now. You know, we're doing well, uh, not just with the info side, but trying to get into the ecom side heavily with the physical products. And while you can do that abroad, it's easier when you're." where your suppliers are, where your customers are. So we said three to five years, you know, that was the plan. And uh, basically, yeah, you could say it's a sacrifice for three to five years for the sake of uh, growth. Yep. You know, we're, we're here doing our management meetup in, in Thailand. And, you know, every time we do this, we do this three, four times a year. We're all in the same place and collaborating from the same area. You know, it makes it a little bit easier for sure. And so I could see the value of that. It does. Uh, we, we get together, you know, every three or four months and then we kind of break up and kind of go our own way. So we got like our location independence then. 
and then we get everyone together. Now we try and do it in like nice locations and do it in like resorts and, and retreats and that kind of thing, which makes it nice um, and like not office y. But I get what you're saying. Like there'd probably be value in us like just going to the US and hashing out for three to five years. We're just not willing to make that sacrifice. <laughs> that sounds horrible, but it's true. No, we're not. And, and I'll say, Justin, we had this conversation in Saigon at Beirut. We were sitting there and I was like, it was before I left and I was so excited about it, you know, again, like for the opportunity. And you said to me, you're like, yeah, we'll talk in a year. And like, tell me what you think then. And I'll tell you, like, I'm still happy we're here. And again, I'm still happy. I said three to five years, not a lifetime, but it's a much bigger sacrifice than I thought it would be. Like not even, you know, talking like a 10 X scale of what I thought I was giving up compared That's to what crazy. I did. Yeah. yeah. All right. Well, let's, let's, let's get into this. And, you know, because I get this question, I'm sure you get this question from the students of yours that are in the drops of livestock course. And they're wondering, especially when they're newbies, right? They're like, who the hell would sell a profitable store? Why would anyone sell an e-commerce business that's making money? And we get this from buyers. We get this from buyers. And they're like, you know, if they're selling, there's got to be something wrong with it. It can't be doing well. It doesn't make any sense. Right. And newbies are like, you know, I don't believe it. Because if I were able to make a profitable dropshipping store, I would never sell my golden goose. What's yeah. your What's your answer to that? Like, what, what do you What do you yeah. tell people? Uh, I always say be cautious when you're buying a site because I think a lot of people do try to sell for the wrong reasons. So you know th they are out there those people that are kind of trying to get rid of a a bad project or something that's losing. But there's so many like good reasons. Like, and this is funny. Like when I sold my first site. It actually, it was right before I started like posting on the Warrior Forum in 2011. Uh, it's when I sold a group of stores and we sold them. That was myself and a business partner. And it was because we were both independent. We lived in different places. I was in North Carolina at that time. He was still in New York. We both felt like, you know, one was doing more than the other. And it's like, well, who's going to put the time in if we want to grow this thing? And they were big. So eventually we said, let's reach out to brokers. Let's, you know, see what like the site's worth only because one of us was going to buy the other one out. We weren't planning on selling, but let's yeah. put a value. Cause at first, you know, I was like, Oh, maybe I'll give you like 5,000. He's like, give you 10,000. Then we spoke to a, a bunch of brokers and they told us what it was worth. And we were like, wait, what? You know, like I'm not buying you out. And he's like, I'm not buying you out. So he said, okay. And then that's why we sold. So, you know, very healthy, profitable business, just, uh, not even like a disagreement, but just two different paths we could have taken. And we, neither one wanted to invest more time when we didn't yeah. think the other was doing the same. It, it's not uncommon for someone to build a business and then, uh, you know, the, the seller, like to your point, they actually think they've gotten it as big as it's going to get, right? The seller's like, look, it, it can only go down from here, right? But that that's their perception. It may or may not be true. They may be true that it has nowhere to go but down and, and the buyer who buys it isn't going to be able to grow it out. Uh, or it may just be their perception thing and they've done as much as they can. A lot of times buyers have particular skill sets. So like I know how to do paid traffic better than most people. I see this person didn't do a very good job, so it's maxed out from their perspective, but it's completely not true. I buy this business, I can, I can tear it up. Uh, a lot of other reasons, like you mentioned, uh, partner disagreements or like different plans and uh, they want to buy one out or, you know, it's funny that but you, you, you had that issue and then you're like, hey, let's both sell. That sounds awesome. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's good reasons too. People want to travel the world. People want to yep. exit their business. People want to get married. Heck, we even helped somebody adopt a baby. One yeah, time. they so, needed, wow. they sold like a five figure business because they yeah. needed to adopt. It's not cheap to adopt, apparently. Yeah. Um, I'm not heading down that route anytime soon, <laughs> but like apparently it's like it's, it costs the thing, it costs money. Yeah. Um, you know, the one we get a lot is like, I need cash for another business venture. And like, that sounds like a cheesy answer. And quite honestly, it is. There's probably reasons yeah. behind that. But if you look at some of the things that are out there right now, like a lot of people are getting into FBA, for example, Anton, you know this. Mm -hmm. um, if I need cash, I just need cash to bump my yeah. FBA business. It's a cash hog. So it's going to suck down my cash. I need it for inventory. So I may need to sell off one of my businesses to fund the cash for this new business that I'm growing. And the big one is time. If they have a new project yeah. going on, they don't have the time to run both projects. They feel like they're going to neglect this profitable store that they have. And they want to free up that time to work on this new project. So why not inject some cash? exit that business and get into something new. If it's a big business, think about this right now with you, Anton. We're, we're in the boat right now at Empire Flippers. We're like, you know, we've got a lot tied up in this business, right? Like effort and energy. And so sometimes people will sell because they want to diversify their wealth. So maybe they're very tied up in drop shipping stores, for example, and they've done a lot of them and they pump them out, they knock them out, you know, a couple of year. Um, and they're like, look, I, I want other assets. I want another asset class. So I'm going to buy real estate or I'm going to buy yeah, Bitcoin. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Buy. 
<laughs> yeah, I don't, I don't know yeah. about that. But like, yeah. you know, they want to they want to have a side investments that are not directly tied to the success or failure of their drop shipping skills, right? Do, do, do and speaking about like, that? yeah, no, I yeah, was going to say like, as far as like the success or failure thing, I think a lot of people once they get some success and they start getting sales, and let's say they have like a year of you know making some money, then they know what their store is worth on a marketplace. Like if you guys were to sell it, and then it's it's. You know, the truth is like the average American family right now, I think they have like 5,000 in savings. So a lot of people, even if like, let's say they have a cash flow business and it's, you know, kicking off four or 5K a month net profit, right? And that's paying for their house and maybe they have a wife and two kids and that's, they're spending it all, right? So even if they have a healthy business, they, they might be broke because maybe they're spending all that money. And then if they hear like, well, you know, I, I'm late on my mortgage or I need more money and they could sell that for what it's actually worth to someone who's not gonna try to live off that and spend it all, you know, I think a lot of times people do sell for that reason. They don't want to admit it because people don't want to sell, you know, saying like I have no money and I have a successful business, but a lot of people get themselves into that situation. Yeah, there's, there's a misconception too that this dropshipping business or whatever businesses that you have is the golden goose. That's the one that should continue to pay and continue to pay you. And that's just not the case. What's the golden goose are the skill sets that you've made that allow you to repeat that process over and over again. Uh, the business itself is likely the egg right? Uh, the, it's the skill set that allows you to recreate that over and over again and keep pumping out eggs. I, to feed I, I fight with sellers about this all the time. You know, a lot of, they get nervous because they've only been successful once. And what they don't realize is they've developed a skill set that can enable them to be successful again. Um, you know, it wasn't luck. Was there some luck involved? Perhaps. But, you know, the fact that they have, they learn these skills, they've, they've shown that they can be successful means they can do it again. So, uh, you know, don't get too wrapped around selling the golden egg. It's definitely yeah. more of a goose situation. By the way, for anyone asking questions, uh, we're going to get the questions. Uh, definitely. We want to take your questions. Um, so we're going to leave a bunch of time at the end for that. So go ahead and add your questions. No problem. Uh, and then we're going to get to those. We've covered kind of like who would sell and why people were selling. Let's talk a little bit about how valuations work. Now, this is true for almost, well, for any of you watching this, right? It's probably, it doesn't apply for Twitter. It's not going to apply for like major unicorn businesses in the valley. But for the rest of us, these valuations apply across the board. And it's a really fairly simple formula. Valuation is determined by your net profit, your net monthly profit or annual profit, depending, uh, times a multiple, and then adding in any assets. Uh, for example, with an e-commerce business, it'd be you know, inventory at cost or wholesale inventory costs. So, you know, net profit, let's say that you're doing $10,000 a month, multiples range from 20 to 40, even 50 X, depending on the type of business. So at $10,000 a month, um, let's say you have no assets in particular and you go to 30 X multiple, you're looking at $300,000 valuation, pretty straightforward. Now net profit, uh, let's talk a little bit about net profit, Joe. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the key things to remember here is net profit is one of the easiest ones for you to control, right? Um, by limiting your expenses, by making sure you have, you know, the, the, the best uh, supplier out there that gives you the best profit margin, um, making sure that you don't have any uh, fat in the business kind of thing, exploratory marketing, these kind of things, extra expenses. That means you're pretty lean. And that is very valuable to buyers. And that means that side of the equation is going to be maxed out. Yeah. So you might be doing, let's say you're doing $30,000 a month in sales. Uh, you've got, you know, $15,000 in cost of goods. You've got 5,000 in like software costs and you got one employee. Um, that's $10,000. We do not include uh, the seller or entrepreneur's uh, salary because that can change, right? They pay themselves a thousand bucks a month or 10,000 bucks a month. So that's not actually, uh, that's not a hit against you. That's going to go into profit and ultimately into the value. Yeah, we call that seller discretionary earnings, not to get too technical or, or use too many uh, acronyms. It's SDE in the industry. Uh, and, and that's considered part of the cash flow that a buyer would expect to be able to get out of the business. So if you are taking a salary from your business, it's something we won't include on the PL and we will consider that part of the profit. So, so having a profitable business is helpful, but Anton, that's helpful for almost everything else too, right? <laughs> yeah. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, uh, that's what people are buying, right? They're buying cash flow. That's what yeah, they're that's, buying. That's exactly what they're looking for. In terms of multiple, I mean, obviously, uh, you know, if you're selling at a 20 X versus a 40 X, that's a huge difference. A $10,000 a month of profit, I'm looking at either a $200,000 valuation or $400,000 valuation. We get you know a lot of questions about what that means. And we're going to talk about that in a minute. But ultimately, it's based on a risk profile. 
So the buyer is going to look at a business and say, look, how risky is this business? If it's more risky, I'm going to buy it at a lower multiple. If it's less risky, I'm going to buy it at a higher multiple. And there's a bunch of things to determine that, which we're going to get into. But that's the general framework you can think about is like, from a buyer's perspective, what am I getting? How likely are those cash flows to continue? And what are my chances personally on actually continuing to run this business and be, have, being successful? At that? Yeah, and I think it's it's important to remember at Empire Builders, we use a monthly multiple. So when you're hearing 20 to fix 50X, yeah. that's not 20 to 50 years. This is a shark tank. We're not <laughs> <Yeah>. doing that. <laughs> but that's, that's crazy yeah, valuations. You know, a little bit under two years to uh, three years, four years, or, or you know, a, around that, that range. So... Um, and the multiple, obviously, as especially as the net profit goes up, can have a huge impact on your overall value and price. Anton, I'll tell you what, what sucks is, you know, a lot of times sellers come to us and we have to be the bearer of bad news, right? We're like, someone's look, and, and you probably get this too, like, look, I put all this money into this business and like, I've, I've, I've developed it and I spent all this, you know, I spent $200,000 getting this business, yeah. you know, running. And well, how much does it make? Oh, it makes 500 bucks a month, but look, it has the potential to make a hundred thousand dollars a month, yeah. right? It's sad because we're like, well, it may have potential, but then you should get it there, and then we'll sell it. That's awesome. If it's so close to it, then do that. But it's probably not the case. Well, the, well, the good news is is that DSL members are probably on Shopify, which means yeah. they probably didn't spend two hundred thousand dollars developing. Yeah, it. right. <laughs> but the thing is, we, we do have a lot of people that call in and they email in, and they find us, but they find it's kind of too late. Like you know, they wanted to build a website, so they went on Google and typed in wherever they're from. You know, New York City web development, paid someone fifty k, a hundred k, and then yeah. now you know, a year later, no sales came in, and why did no sales come in? And that's the main thing, like. Sales aren't based on even design. Like some of our best sites back in the day were the ugliest ones. And we yeah. paid out these like crazy redesigns. They wouldn't convert any better. It's just, yeah, it's not money in, it's marketing. You know, and that's one thing I know you guys too. I, like I, marketing I, is online business. That bothers me a little bit, Anton, that sometimes it's the, the kind of uglier sites that sell better. It's frustrating. From I'm a marketing guy. It's just frustrating from a marketer's perspective where like these crappy looking sites convert, particularly in like, I'd say, um, like the older demo niche, right? So older demographics, they like kind of a 90s or early 2000s type of website. And you're like, oh God, I, you know, this, but it works, right? It's yeah. business. I, I mean, I think one of the things you probably see a lot is people that have this crazy idea for a very unique product and they want to design it. They want to, you know, spend all this money on industrial design and finding a custom manufacturer and all this stuff. And you have no idea if it's going to really sell or not. And, uh, yeah. you know, it's better to find a supplier who has a track record of success because there's a market out there. I think you talk about this in your, in your course a lot. If other people are selling it and making money, that's a mm -hmm. good thing, right? Yeah. Yeah. And that's actually, so we've had people that have like worked with us a dropship lifestyle and they've wanted to get into different industries and they've wanted to do that. They've wanted to make the product and be the brand. Some of them had family connections, to like different products and you know, they, they already kind of had the brand. And I still tell them like, listen, Build a drop shipping store, sell for the top 10 people in that space already. And you know, you're getting paid to get data. Like whatever, even if your profit margin, you know, is 15, 20, 25 percent, you're learning what sells, you're learning what the customers want, you're figuring out traffic, you're figuring out that audience, then spend the money to, you know, release your own product into the marketplace. Yeah, and, and bring it back to valuation, that's definitely what buyers are looking for. They're they're not looking for some unique product or idea that maybe might sell, has the huge potential. In, in this area of, of the world, they're, you know, uh, uh, the kind of marketplace uh, on the lower end, under $10 million kind of valuation, they're looking for businesses that shoot off cash. And if your business doesn't make a profit, um, it might be valuable to someone, but it's not valuable to the vast majority. Yeah, most, most markets. Let, let's get into that. So we, we talked about, you know, a valuation somewhere, a multiple somewhere between 20 and 40 times your net monthly profit. Let's talk about what? Before you know, before we go any further, which is say obviously profit is a huge one. So if you can cut out and Joe mentioned this exploratory marketing or spend on things, you know, some software that you added, you're not actually using. If you can get rid of some of those things, um, that's going to improve your profit, which is ultimately going to improve your valuation. So profit is key. But aside from profit, let's look at multiple. That what's the difference between that 20x and 40x? One of the main things will be earning trends, right? Are the earnings increasing month over month? Are they increasing year over year? Are they steady? Are they kind of flatlined or kind of steadied out? Um, last year, when you look at the year over year trends, uh, if it's seasonal, did it go up to about the same height in the Christmas season and go down to the same during the summer? 
or was it slightly higher, 10, 20, 30% higher? Yeah. Has it, is it decreasing month over month? Like where is it at in terms of trends? It, and it's not to say that sites that are decreasing or declining are unsellable. They are sellable. There are buyers out there that are interested in but these kind a, of assets. It's going to hurt your multiple. It's going to hurt your multiple and it means that the price is going to be lower and it's going to, because because that's going to reduce the, the, the buyer pool and, it, and it's going to, they're going to see it as more risky because right. you're having a year over year decline. Whereas if you have steady income or inclining income, that's valuable to buyers because they know that they're getting an asset they can depend on. Uh, particularly with a, with a do you, what do you guys do? What do you guys talk about like in your course about seasonality? Uh, well, that's, that's one thing that I was curious because, you know, we, we've built seasonal stores and people ask me all the time, like, Hey, I have this idea. Should I do it? You know, whatever. Let's say they want to sell like inflatable, Christmas ornaments for your front lawn, right? And okay, you're gonna probably have, if you're good with traffic, you're gonna crush it for maybe two months, definitely one, and you're good. So let's just say someone builds that business and let's say for two Christmases in a row, you know, they make a lot of money and maybe it does trend up a bit. Is that worth 20X even? You know, like yeah, to, to a buyer? Yeah, yeah. yeah, it's fine. The thing is, is that, you know, with, with something that's that seasonal, that or like Halloween masks, for yeah, example, right? Yeah, I was gonna right? say, we sold the Halloween costume business. We yes. sold one. Yeah. yeah. And, and so it, it is possible to sell it as long as you have that kind of seasonal history. We need 12 months. We need 12 months of if we get at least yeah, in two, that deal. Two cycles. So when you have an extreme seasonal business like Halloween or Christmas targeted, and, you know, it might it might go down to zero in, in the other months. Yep. Uh, <laughs> yeah. yeah. <laughs> then it's really important that you have two big seasonal cycles. So, you know, two years basically of of history. Okay. This, you know, that's what buyers are looking for. They're, they want to be able to kind of predict the future and why those there's no guarantees in this. Um, yeah. That kind of gives them enough data to make an assumption that it might be that in the future. Again, something that's going to help your 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 multiple, which ultimately leads to your valuation, uh, the age of the business. So if you've been around for just 18 months or if you've been around for four years, that is going to make a difference. So literally, and, and it's just all other things being equal, the business is staying the same, being around for two years versus four years, you're going to get more money for the four-year-old business. So if you just hold on to it for a little bit longer, it's going to go up. How much? I mean, we're not talking a 10x you know, increase in your valuation. <laughs> But you're going to get more money for an older business. That's you know, and it goes back to a buyer's perception of risk, yeah. right? And they say a business has only been around a year and a half, eh, maybe doesn't have the legs that a four-year-old business might have. Does that make sense? How, yeah. How so with that it? though, if you have that four-year business, how far back are you judging profit? You're, you're not yeah, going back so four years. We're going, right? to, we're going to base valuation on the last twelve months or trailing twelve months. But okay. buyers, if you've got the history, buyers are going to look at that history. So they're going to want to go back a year, two years, three years. So you're going to want to prepare that documentation, even if your valuation is not based on those previous numbers. Buyers are going to look at the year over year trends. That okay. how long does it typically take people in in the dropship lifestyle course to start making some sort of revenue and profit on the store? Yeah, you know. It's like impossible because there, there's people like, as I'm sure you know, you know, that have been active in our community for three years that talk about how they're going to build a business one day. And there's people that after two weeks have a sale come in. So it varies so much. Um, and it also depends like on what you know, I guess, coming into it, because we do try to teach everything at like starting at a one on one level. But at the same time, like if you've built a website before or if you're familiar with even like like terminology, you know, like what's Google AdWords, what's Shopify, like it makes a big difference. So we've seen people get sales in as little as two weeks. And, you know, we've had people for years that are figuring it out. Anton, what age, what age are you, most of your students? I mean, you must have some, some numbers or some idea there. Like yeah, what yeah, are, no, we, are uh, the men, we, over, men over women, women over men, like what age groups? Yeah. We survey people after they uh, enroll and our biggest demographic is male. It's about like 80% male and the average age is, you know, mid thirties. And that surprised me. I thought we'd have like, in, you know, I just thought it was going to be like younger people that, oh, I want to travel. I see this like back when I was in, you know, Thailand and I was in Vietnam. I thought it was that. But uh, our average customer is actually a male with a family and children that isn't even really looking to quit his job or, you know, her job. If it's one of the 20% the of females, they just kind of want to make some extra money and maybe one day it turns into something big. Yeah. But, that's yeah that's, uh, one, one of the reasons I mentioned is like, I, you know, there are a lot of people. A lot of seniors, I guess the most we put, like people 50, 60 years old that have plenty of cash, right? And they're looking for something to do. They're looking for something particularly they can do online. They want to stay involved, but maybe they're either getting close to retiring or they've already retired. 
and like, you know, drop shipping and other like types of online business models might be a really good fit. So I don't know if you cater to that market or if you have some kind of like special get them up to speed with terminology and, you know, like how to use the back end of Shopify and something, but that might be an interesting kind of like add on piece to your to, business. Yeah. That's to a be, total side note. But. To be clear, seniors are not 50 years old because I'm 42. <laughs> 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 Close enough, right? Close enough. Yeah. All right, so yeah, but I, I think it might be interesting. Let's get back into um, to the factors that are going to affect uh, your multiple. Uh, the pricing window, we generally use 12 months, right, for the pricing window. So we're going to look at the last 12 months to get an average of your monthly net profit. Uh, not always used, though, and the times it wouldn't be used is if you like if you got significant increase over the last 12, 18 months, then using 12 months just isn't really – a fair representation of where the business is at. Same thing if it's like heavily declining, yeah. right? So like going back a full 12 months, well, that's unfair because we're basing it on where it was a year ago, which just isn't where it is today. And that's what I was kind of talking about with your averages for students and how you know quickly they make money, stuff like that. If they've had their store for two years, but only really in the last six months was it making a good profit, mm-hmm. you know, our pricing window, we might shorten that a little bit to kind of better represent where the business is at right now. Ideally with e-commerce yeah. though in particular, we want 12 months. Yeah, That's really right. what we're looking for is a 12 month earning history. Again, because of that cycle, right? We're very concerned that any cycle, any any sort of seasonality, we want to average that out over 12 months. Another yeah, thing that affects, that affects your multiples and be how much work is required, right? Yeah. And I know Anton that in your course, you talk about SOPs, you talk about how to build a business that doesn't require you all the time. And that's ideal. That's to give you a higher multiple because if buyers can buy the business and have process in place uh, or people in place that continue to run the business, um, it's just worth a lot more to potential investors and buyers. I see this a lot um, from you know guys that are running their business and and they're 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 doing a lot of hours because they're doing the marketing themselves. They're talking to suppliers. They talk to the customers. You know, they pick up the phone or they're on chat or or whatever it is, uh, and they. And when they go to sell, you know, it really reduces the buyer pool. And yeah. that makes makes the multiple have to be lower because we have to be able to sell that on, on the market. Um, so you want to put as much automation into this place. Maybe not in the beginning. Figure it out yourself. And, it's got to work first. Yeah, it's got to yeah. work first. It's got to be profitable. But but then go ahead and make sure that you're uh, uh, trying to put this automation in place, especially yeah. if you're looking to sell. And I'm sure you guys caution people about this too, but that's such a good point. You know, like people aren't trying, well, most of the time people aren't trying to buy themselves, you know, an eight hour day or another 10 hour day. They're trying to buy that. And a lot of time, like from the, uh, the seller side, because back after I sold a bunch of sites for a while, I was like, oh, maybe I'll buy something already established. And I started to like, you know, kind of shadow these people and like have conversations with people selling other e-commerce sites. And what I realized is they've said, you know, yeah, it takes two hours a day to run. Then you see what they do. And it's really like, you know, four or five, six hours. But maybe in their minds, like, you know, they're doing it like in the morning for a little bit, then they pop it in the afternoon. But they, it, like, I don't know if they're intentionally lying, but it's more work than they yeah, said. Well, look, I mean, one of the things we do is we, we <laughs> vet all the earnings and traffic right in the business. So we're sure those are, you know, legit. What we don't do is sit with all the sellers every day to see exactly how many hours they put in. And if you're looking for a place where it's a little untrue, yeah, look for the work required. Yeah, yeah. And I also think that, you know, you, you see this in dropship lifestyle in your own business, and we see it in Empire Blippers. I've been doing this for years. What I can do in six hours, somebody else 12 hours, right? Yep. Uh, That's a good because, point, too. Because yeah. I'm very used Definitely. to it. Yeah. So that kind of training and ramp up, you know, uh, is, is a big factor, but it's something that we can figure out during the sales process. If, if you see a business that's five hours a week required, and another one says 30 hours a week required, you can be sure that there is a difference. Um, but always don't don't assume that the exact hours are the exact hours you're going to have to put in because they may be uh, fibbing a little on their hours or you just may not be able to do it as quickly as they are. Yeah, maybe, yeah. maybe you're faster. But, but, the, like, but the key factor is here, the more work required from the owner, from, you know, from the, the, the seller, yeah. the, the lower the multiple is going to be. The more automation in place and the less hours required by the seller, the higher the multiple will be. All right. So, you know, in general, when we're talking uh, valuation for our multiples, uh, less risk to the buyer is it gives you the highest uh, multiple. We talked about some of the reasons that'll, that'll, you know, the risk factors that buyers look for, they'll give you the higher multiple. Let's look at some actual real life, real world examples of e-commerce businesses we've sold 
and talk about why one sold for the amount it did versus the other. So we have two real world Shopify stores we sold at Empire Flippers. One was a 33X uh, valuation or multiple, and one was at a 20X multiple. So the first one was a 33X uh, multiple. It was a $600,000 drop shipping e-commerce store. Um, this one, what was the niche in this? Well, it was accessories. Well, yeah, it's 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 uh, accessories uh, in the sort of fashion niche. We can't reveal the actual, so uh, you know, our apologies for that. But obviously, the the buyer and the seller probably wouldn't appreciate that. Um, but yeah, this was was in the accessories niche. Uh, it was dropship business, a little bit of e-commerce as well. One of the larger businesses. Uh, with a net profit of uh, more than $18,000 a month. Uh, some of the benefits of this a particular store, it had well-blended traffic channels. Uh, I had a strong, profitable, paid traffic channel, had great social media. It was a real brand. So it's something that like, you know, had name recognition, was known, at least not well-known, but well-known in their kind of like small niche. Yeah. Um, a very well-automated business. And uh, you know, for this business, is 33x. We use a 12 month pricing time frame. So th even though it was drop ship, the the products that they were selling had their own name on them, and their oh. their manufacturer was was labeling those and 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 sending those out. Do you have many uh, students that that do that kind of private label? Approach? Yes, but that's kind of like a next step thing. I would say the majority definitely not. But one thing that we do and we stress a lot is, you know, even though you're not branding the actual products, you should be a brand in the industry because, you know, we don't build those shopping mall type sites. We build very specific niche stores. So right. at least like your store name and all your marketing, you should have like if someone, you know, whatever, if you sold like high end wallpaper, interior designers should know your store name as a brand in that space. So we kind of go that route. It's hard to put a, an exact value on brand a lot of times. But it is valuable, especially when you sell a business. We've so, seen a turn toward that too. Yeah. Like over the last couple of years, there's just more interest in actual brands. And I think this has to do with the kind of the attention economy and like, you know, are you capturing people's attention yeah. and their interests and like, you know, as a brand, as a Because you, you bring know. you bring up the general kind of mall store and I tell you that's that's really bottom rung. We Our, sold those businesses, and people buy them, and people can sell them, and they they can yeah. sometimes make money for sure. But the, it, it is it is tough. I just see less of it. It's it. usually moving in a different direction. Yeah, I mean, yeah. you know, it's, it's hard to go on social media and promote your general mall, mall store, right? Like, yeah. How do you do that? <laughs> right. All right. So let's let's, let's get back to this. Eighteen thousand dollars a month in profit sold for six hundred thousand dollars. A nice payday for the seller. Let's talk about a second uh, drop shipping store. In the same niche, close to the same niche, it's in the accessory space, um, and it sold at 20 times monthly net profit. It's a smaller business, right? So it only did $5,000 a month in net profit. Um, there was a small paid traffic campaign, but the traffic overall uh, was not a very well diversified strategy. It was mostly just organic traffic. Um, and organic's not bad necessarily, but like there's not, it's not a blended like you kind know, of well-oiled uh, traffic strategy where it's safer and, and uh, uh, more long-term and sustaining. Yeah, and it was a very random store, whereas the first example was... Uh, on-brand, you know, on-message. Yeah, and, and really only sold two different types of products in the, in the fashion niche. Um, this one sold, looked like everything in the fashion yep. niche. All over the place, so many SKUs, so many product things to update, uh, you know, all that kind of thing, it, it obviously has an impact on how to run the business. So the first one sold 600,000 at 33 X multiple, uh, one hour ish of work a week. The second example sold for hundred thousand at 20 X multiple. We're talking 15 hours of work per week. So, you know, the person about that knew they were buying into a, at least a part-time job yeah. um, for both of them. We yeah. use a 12 month time frame. That's, that's typical for an e-commerce drop shipping <laughs> business. We're looking at 12 month time frame, and we did that for, for both of them. So, I mean, there's just two examples one at 600,000 at 33X, one at 100,000 at 20X, and you yeah. can see some clear differences between the two. When you sold your stores, uh, Anton, what, what kind of pricing did you guys go through the pricing with any of the brokers or people? Yeah, we there? ended up getting about 30. Yeah. About 30X monthly net. Yeah. Yeah. But that was with years of history. I think it was like the first round was like three and a half years, the second year was over four at that point. So, uh, 
yeah, they had they had a track record. And, you know, same thing, like our brand names, even though we didn't have our branded products, our stores were known in the niches that we were in because we did things like, you know, advertise on different blogs that everyone in those industries followed and uh, basically ran a lot of ads. So we were in front of everyone for years. So that that helped. Um, yeah. Yeah. yeah I'm curious. I, I, I guess not curious. I wanted to call this out, though, for like everyone watching, like to pay attention. Like maybe if people are looking to buy stores or even that don't like the, maybe they don't have a store yet and they're thinking of building one. Like what you just gave those two examples, like if someone's going to build a store today, they could build, you know, one one route or the other route or there's a million other routes. But like it's so important to realize that probably for the same amount of time into building it, the same amount of effort, the same amount of everything, you could have one store that's worth, what was it, 100K and one that's worth yeah. 600. Like. Yeah. And the one that was worth six hundred is less work involved, right? That's what you said. That's yeah. right. It's yeah. Wrong. So like it's so like that's that's how you actually like make money with not just e-commerce but with anything online. You have there's a lot of ways to make money. They're not all good ideas. <laughs> well, you know you know what's interesting too. When you think about the multiple one at thirty three x one at eighteen x, right? Let's just say the bigger one, the first one we're talking about, the, the larger multiple. Let's say it had the same multiple at twenty x. We're talking about a three hundred sixty thousand dollar valuation, right? So that's a two hundred and forty thousand dollar difference. Right yeah. by by doing those things, having a blended traffic strategy, by having um, a real brand, a real and successful brand, uh, by having it automated to where you have less than you know like one hour ish a week, um, like these are the things that really help. And it, it can cost you money to not do that. Let's put it that way. Yeah, yeah. and and that's why you know the more profit, obviously, the the, the higher it's going to sell for right there. It's a it's a big part of the equation. Yeah. All right, so let's talk a little bit about selling your store and the process for selling your store. Uh, Joe can go through this like the back of his hand. He's our <laughs> resident sales expert. Yeah. Um, but when you're selling with Empire Flippers, we want to just give you kind of like a, 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 a gist of kind of how it works. Um, you know, first off, you're going to submit your listing for sale with us. And we have a valuation tool you can use to determine kind of like get an idea on what your multiple is. We said 20 to 40x or more or less. And that's super wide ranging. So the first thing to do would be go to our valuation tool where you can get an idea. It'll, it'll shorten that uh, kind of spectrum down for you based on the information you submit. Um, after you've done the valuation tool, you have an idea what your valuation is. You can submit your business for sale, and then we go through what's called the vetting process. It takes normally two to three weeks for us to verify your traffic, your earnings, all the information about the business, you as a seller. And I think that's one of the things that buyers particularly like, Anton, is that we vet, vet and verify that information. Um, but it's also kind of a warning to people that don't have their information together that they shouldn't bother. Well, you know, Anton, you were, you were bringing this up when we first started talking and you were saying there are a lot of sellers out there who sell for the wrong reason. And one of those wrong reasons is the, the business doesn't make any money. And, you know, they, with all the numbers and everything, you know, on other platforms, I won't mention where uh, you can definitely get kind of cornered into buying a store that you think is making money based on top line revenues. And then once you get it under your control, realize, oh my God, this thing is underwater. At Empire Flippers, we vet that and we talk to sellers and we dig deeply into their numbers to make sure it's the truth. Yeah, and that's definitely why your guys are doing so well. And like Empire Flippers has grown so much. People, there was such a need for that. Because for years, like I watched, you know, those other sites that don't vet the sites they sell. And it's just like, I would go through and it's like comical almost, you know, like once you know, if you don't know, you think you're getting all these amazing deals and like, oh, I'm getting this massive business. But once you know, it's just like, how is this happening over and over? And especially like you guys mentioned earlier, sometimes it's that older demographic that has money to spend. That's usually yeah. who they find first. Unfortunately, they spend it there. And not only do they buy something that doesn't have a cash flow, sometimes it actually would lose them money to stay in business. You know, if they tried to keep getting sales. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. Yep. Uh, you know, after the vetting process, after it's been vetted, then we're going to go ahead and get the business listed, the store listed on our marketplace. We don't share the information, so the niche isn't going to be revealed. It's only uh, revealed to depositors or basically uh, effectively VIPs that we have come along and request the information. So these are people that have bought from us before and, and are experienced. So we're now getting depositor inquiries and people that are interested in potentially buying the business. And there's a lot of back and forth. So sellers need to be very active during this period, answering questions doing the back and forth with them so to make sure that they and are we'll, And we'll responding. assist during that period. Obviously, we have a staff at Empire Flippers to, to help you. If you don't know how to answer a question correctly, you need help. Um, even pre-submitting your site, if you do want to talk to one of our business advisors, 
you can set up a call with us. We'll give you a link later for that. Uh, and, and we can kind of walk you through the process. So if, if Justin's going through this too quickly for you, uh, we, we can we can kind of. Yeah, we'll, we'll have a link. People can do a call. But there's uh, one of the cool things we do is we, when we get into the nitty gritty, uh, kind of the, the crazy stuff is when we do buyer seller conference calls. So that's when you as a uh, Shopify store seller um, are going to field an inquiry from a buyer that wants you on the phone. So what our business advisor will do, we'll get you on the phone for a pre-call, Anton, and they will be like, look, here's the buyer. Here's what they're looking for. Here's what, here's kind of where we, where, where, what our approach is going to be. They get on the call with them and actually our, our guys will, will facilitate the call. Um, and then they'll do a post-mortem on the call and say, look, here's where, what, I, what offer I think we can expect. Here's what I'm going to do to really attract other potential buyers and get this deal done. So it's a very kind of all-inclusive deal on these buyer-seller conference calls that our guys go yeah, to Yeah, and, that, and that's something we came up with because we saw frustration from sellers in on other platforms where, you know, the broker just left them high and dry and said, good luck, sell it yourself, you know, I get paid either way. And yeah. we try to take a more active role in that process. When you sold your stores, Anton, did did you know, did you have to kind of sell your, sell the store yourself or? No, no, no. We went through uh, two different brokerages, like one for each, I guess, round. And uh, I'll tell you like, that's good. Cause those calls, like they're scary, you know, like, especially cause yeah. you don't know, even like, I'm sure from the buyer, but from the seller, like, as I'm sure you guys know, there's some people that buy a lot of businesses and they're sharks, you know? And yeah. if you're like, we were, we were two guys that started some websites, made some money. And like, then all of a sudden someone that's been doing this for a lot longer is on the phone. You like to have like someone on your side or even just to kind of like mediate that's, that's massive. And that's yeah. why people say like, sometimes like, Oh, I don't have to pay a fee. I'll just sell my yeah. site, pay the fee because it's so easy to lose money. Well, that's, that's the next piece is yeah. a negotiation. So after you've done the buyer seller call, they're going to come back with offers. And like you mentioned, some of these guys are sharks. And we work with like industry professionals, like they literally buy and sell businesses on a regular basis. So we have a bunch of them uh, in our audience and they will shark it out. And so we know how to deal with them. We're not as personally uh, invested in the business. So a lot of times sellers will hear an offer and they get offended, right? <laughs> They're like, how dare you say my blood, sweat and tears is only worth this. You're crazy. Whereas yeah. like, we're like, no, 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 we're, you know, we, we, we it's not our blood, sweat and tears. Right. So we can argue on your behalf and say, you know, look, here's we the thing. We can be more objective about it. And, and we know. actually, we actually, to be fair, a little secret, Anton, is okay. we, we soften the, the offers from the buyers before we take them to the seller too. Yeah. So where a buyer may just be like, here's what I'm offering. And, this, and we know that would piss the seller off. So we have to kind of like yeah. massage it a little bit. And here, here's yeah. the offer. We'll work this deal. And, and, and that's part of negotiation is, is definitely providing a good counter offer where, you know, people people mistake this. They think that negotiations is haggling. It's not the same thing. The no. the you know the the Southeast Asia go to the market and haggle <laughs> over the price of fish or beef or something like that. That doesn't work in business negotiation. You have to balance your offers and and give up something to get something. Uh, and we have a lot of experience doing this because we do it hundreds of times every year. Uh, and we can help people get you know, the, the best price for their business. The other thing we do is, is migration. So let's say that you come to a deal after negotiation and the business needs to be migrated. You know, someone who doesn't sell businesses on a regular basis isn't used to like the process of turning over the business. And, you know, you, one thing you want to do, obviously, is you want to make sure that no one ends up with both the money and the business at the same time, right? Because that's a recipe for disaster. <laughs> so actually doing that kind of handover, making sure the business is set up and in the buyer's account and everything's running smoothly, making sure the seller then gets paid is all part of our process. When you sold your businesses, how was the handover? You did the escrow? Like what was the- Yeah, was so the we, we had the uh, the brokers actually said like they could do it. And did I like this is without knowing them, you know, besides doing a Google search. So scary. I went a lawyer and actually had uh, the buyer send a cashier's check to the lawyer. So the lawyer put it in escrow, our lawyer. And then oh. even then he's like, yeah, he's like, it cleared. And I was still like, did it really clear? Like, should I try? Like, I was so afraid yeah. to, to, you know, push that button and transfer everything. But yeah, uh, yeah we went you like, and I paid. That was a separate fee that I, I took on just for that peace yeah. of mind. You know, I think that's that's totally reasonable. That, one of the things we, we offer for our customers, but you can use a lawyer. And in fact, we generally recommend that they are bonded and can hold the money in escrow effectively in escrow. Um, and for people that are new to us, especially for large deals, like high six figure, low seven figure. Um, it is a way, it is a preference for particularly those first time buyers and sellers. Uh, we had someone we did that with, it was for I think mid six figures 
and we used our attorney. Was it our attorney? Yeah, we used our attorney. And then he, he yeah, he, he did the escrow. Yeah, and, then, and then the next time he came back to buy a business, he said, please, I don't want to go through that again. Can I just yeah. use the Empire Clippers process? Yeah. So, you know, we can, we can manage that payout process. We can make sure that's done because we have the staff in house, whereas, you know, other brokers and, and platforms probably don't have a big staff like we do. They, they, they want to, to, to kind of put that off of them and, and, and they can't keep up with that. So we have, um, you know, if anyone that's listening to this, this uh, Facebook live stream, if you're interested in learning more, a bit more about drop shipping businesses and how to get started in drop shipping, we're going to put a link for Anton's course on Facebook, if you're interested in potentially getting a valuation, we'll link to our valuation tool or submitting your site for sale. We'll put a link to do that as well as to get more information. But I really want to get into some questions. So let's dig into those. All right, fellas, we got some marketing apprentices here that are helping us out. What do you think, man? What questions we got? Um, let me just go through them. Diane says, what if you start a dropship store and can't keep doing due to family issues? Everything's set up, inventory's updating, consistent. Um, is there minimal, then there's minimal traffic. Uh, can it be sold at all? <laughs> Diane, again, it's really going to depend on the profit of the business, right? That's going to be the critical factor. So if you've got everything set up and it's ready to go and it's earning money, you can definitely sell it. If it's not earning money, you may be able to sell, but not for anything near what you'd probably like to get for it. Yeah. I mean, I will, I will tell you a cautionary story here, just a quick one where someone came to us and they hadn't been running the business and hadn't made any sales in a few months. And before that, they were making good money. We can't really sell that business because right now it's not making any money. So if you are running a business, continue to run that business as best you can. I realize family emergencies might divert that. Um, but if you have a you know decrease down to zero or even negative, uh, it's going to be close to impossible to sell your business. And just because you can't sell with a broker doesn't mean it's not sellable. I've That's seen true. people that, that have stores that don't have earnings in the Dropship Lifestyle community and forum. They're saying, look, I got the store. I just can't follow through with it. Um, you know, is anyone willing to buy it? And they, they kick them a couple hundred bucks just to save them the hassle of getting yeah. set up. Yeah. Sometimes sites like that, like assuming that, you know, if there's minimal traffic, if there's minimal sales or no sales, then it's usually worth what the time was worth to build the site, assuming it's a good looking site and you did it yourself and get supply relationships. So yeah, like, like you guys just mentioned, sometimes we see, you know, 500 to $2,000, depending again on the quality of site and supply relationships you formed. But that's kind of like the max we see around 2k if there's not profit attached to it i got some some uh interesting hellos susan west's hello from gresham morgan may lynn good morning everyone regina carrillo hi anton justin joe from portugal Hi, Oi, regina. Good evening. <laughs> matt eric says good evening anton good morning justin joe wow you guys got your time zones right <laughs> yeah. uh, art small <laughs> asks what are the top five niche websites that are in high demand for buyers? Oh, it's so hard to say. I mean, if I told you some of the example of sites that, that we've sold in the dropship uh, area, you would say, really? Uh, that wouldn't even make my top 100 list for searches on the internet. What surprises me is sometimes they're boring niches. Like they're not the ones where you're like, oh my God, it's so fun. I'd love to have a, you know, a business in that space, right? And, and you're like, that seems just not exciting. Yeah, I mean, I think one of the things that you guys focus on at, at, at DSL is is having those products that are valuable, the $200 products, right? Yeah. Um, because there's there's going to be enough profit margin in there to do your marketing. And, and more importantly than having the top five niches, which, you know, people would probably hate us giving away. <laughs> um, I, I think it's more important that you have a profitable business and, and you do your keyword research and you do your market research to find the right supplier and they're at the right value proposition. Yep. Yeah. I think the boring ones are usually better because most people don't think of them. I mean, like that, to yeah. be honest, like usually people like, especially with dropship lifestyle, like in the course, you know, for the past, five or six years, whenever I created it, I'd give the same two examples. I say you could sell chandeliers or stand up paddle boards. So those things meet like a set of criteria. And then I tell people, those are my examples. Don't sell them. And there's probably, if you like searched on Google, I would have to say a hundred chandelier stores, a hundred paddle board stores, because people just copy those two. You know, we've, we've sold, I think, two stand up paddle board sites. You could still make and money with them. Yeah. 
But yeah, there's a lot of other things that meet the criteria that are a little more boring or less thought of, I guess. Yeah, it, it, it's good for everyone. Like, like, uh, but with niches, like everyone should just agree to like use chandeliers as like the one that everyone will. Like, right? everyone use chandeliers all the time. Yeah. And then- <laughs> Now that we've mentioned chandeliers and stand-up paddle boards, I'm sure oh there's going to be Wait. a glut of it's coming. businesses. It's coming. Yep. And you, know, you, know, you know what's weird is we get like uh, we get little streaks of businesses. So we'll get one, and then we'll sell it, and then we'll get a few more, like a very similar monetization or like, like kind of like a neat trick or a neat niche, and we'll get a few more. And a lot of times it has to do with like someone hearing about it or seeing, oh, they sell businesses of that type. Yeah. I think yep. we can do it. So back to the question. What the, the question we got, John? Top five niches probably change a lot, and you shouldn't be focused too much yep. on that. Yeah. Uh, can you talk? All right. I don't know what's going on here, buddy. Help me out, John. <laughs> you talk about strategies for branding a dropship store. Well, I, yeah. I'd say that's more for Anton than for us. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I would say like the obvious ones, like if you're branded, you know, basically what that means is whatever industry you're in, the people that are, are part of it, like whoever your customer avatar is, that's probably the first step. Figure out who your avatar is. And then be one of the brands that when they think of the product that they're interested in, you know, your name pops into mind. So the easiest ways to do it are connect with communities, like use influencers. So whether that be a YouTube channel about, you know, that not even about your product, like, but about your avatar, something that talks to them, you know, do a, a YouTube, a Facebook live stream like this, do a YouTube interview, get on podcasts, pay to advertise on their blogs, write guest posts for them, right? Like with your name, with your store's name linking back. Um, another big thing is like different, um, you know, just, I don't know, like associations for, I don't know, let's say you sold like electric bicycles. Like, is there an electric bicycle club? Is there like meetups all around the country? See if you could sponsor meetups on meetup.com, you know, get your name out there. And like, that's probably an extreme example of it, but you want to be one of those brands that, that well, will just pop into the avatar's head. You should mention that because we had a business that we sold uh, that was in the biking niche and they wound up sponsoring like the championship for this this particular biking niche. It's, it's not actually just biking. It's a, a particular type of biking. Uh, and I thought that that was a, a really interesting way to promote their business. And those kind of subjective uh, traffic sources are great because if you're only based on paid traffic, you know, uh, you're, you're very valuable and that's a great way to expand your business and buyers see that as valuable. But they like to see sort of a mixed strategy as well. Yeah, good question, Steve Appleton. Blow it up really quick, John. Let me see some of the other comments, and we'll just respond to them as we kind of go down the list. Oh, big one. Oh, God. Doug Henningsen says, uh, seems like one big risk or challenge is competing against Amazon. Amazon knows your business probably better than some operators. I'm sure their pricing algorithms are better than most sellers. Not sure why this won't become even more challenging. Your thoughts? Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a fair question. Amazon is taking over the world right now. So why is Amazon not going to just blow you the hell up and shut your shit down? Yeah, I mean, yeah. I think one of the things you can think about is what Anton was saying before. Um, um, Amazon is not going to go out and do guest posts. Amazon is not going to do podcasts about your biking product, right? They're not going to go out and take that really uh, hands-on approach. I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to cha- challenge you on that. They're going to get more people to Amazon than you are to your dropship site. They're going to get more people. And they're you don't need to get as many get. people as they get. Like they're not trying to make, exactly. you know, a, an extra six figure yeah. income a year. They're trying to be the biggest That's company true. in the world. They're doing very well at yeah. it, but they want to yeah. take the world over. Yeah. Yeah. I, I think though, big things like, like, I, and obviously I buy from Amazon. Like I, if I looked at how much I've spent on that website in the past year, it's probably, it's disgusting, but the stuff that I buy it, even like before I knew what I'm, even when Amazon sold books, that wasn't the type of stuff that I sold either. Like the stuff I buy on Amazon are the prime products. And I know it'll change in the future, but right now what that means is it's typically small. It's typically a household item. For me, it's a lot of electronics, like literally like the computer I'm on right now, my mouse, my keyboard, my microphone, that's all Amazon stuff. That's not stuff I would drop ship. And it's not stuff I would try to like build a brand around either. So I think like for anyone that wants to get into say like traditional e-commerce, you know, you want to create a, a, uh, your own private label brand, or you want to actually create a unique product. I think Amazon should be like one channel of selling, but you know, I can't speak for anything besides like high ticket drop shipping because that's where we mostly focus. And that's not an Amazon thing. Even now, like the brands that will get approved for when you're getting approved and signing the contract, it says like you won't sell on any third party marketplaces. That includes Amazon. That includes eBay. They, that's not what they're looking for. They want the exposure of someone that, you know, has an e-commerce store that's bringing traffic a unique way. So, um, yeah, and again, like, that, you know, like, five years from now, I don't know what that looks like, but not an issue. Yeah, now. I, like, 
Andrew Darian's thing on that with the, uh, we said this the last time we talked, the trolling motors business that he sold, right? So he was, you know, basically he, Amazon sells, you know, for bass fishing or whatever, they sell trolling motors too. What he's really good at is basically explaining the niche to hobbyists and like saying which kind of trolling motor goes best in which types of rivers, right? And Amazon isn't going to do that for you. They're not going to deliver that level of content and value um, to help you better understand the product yeah. because Amazon's like, here's the product, here are the best reviews we could pull, but they're not going to do in-depth research on a, on a motor yeah, I mean, just in think the river. Of, you're just using. think about if you want to ask a question on Amazon, you have this little public area. You kind of have to look if you, if, the, if there's a similar question, if you ask a question, random people can answer that question. I mean, wouldn't you prefer to go to an expert to a site that's all about trolling motors that doesn't sell yeah. laptops as well? and go ahead and, and ask them a question? Of course you would. Yep. All right, what else yeah. we got? We got Mohammed said how to market the first product. We've got a, we want to know the budget average for marketing. We want to know the budget average for marketing and how to mess, best make a marketing plan. Well, it drops your lifestyle, man. I mean, it's relatively inexpensive to get started, right? You're not asking yeah. for like a $15,000 investment in a brand new store. I mean, you're doing a lot of PLA, like a lot of paid, uh, like limited paid traffic to kind of test the market, right? Talk, talk to me a little bit about yeah, that. Yeah, so again, we use multiple traffic sources, but the main one that drives the most sales are Google product listing ads still to this day, um, just because you know it's they're so relevant. Like if you set up your your campaigns properly, they're just so, so relevant and they, they lead to sales. I mean, it's that simple. But as far as like budgets, people always ask me that, like before they you know enroll in my course, like, oh, what should I set aside for advertising? And honestly, like I say, start small, whatever, spend, you know, $20 a day. But then like, they're like, oh, that's it. Like, how am I going to make money? And I say, well, I don't know if a year from now, and we don't do this, like we don't even spend this much, but let's just say a year from now, you spent $100,000 every month on Google ads and you made $200,000 net profit. Would you spend $100,000 a month? So what's the yeah. budget? Then it's 100K a month. Then if you could spend yeah. two and make four, you yeah. do that. So yeah. yeah, but we still like, even now I'd say $20 a day, that's like the, the, the play money, you know, and you look at your impressions, look at your clicks, see where people are going, improve those pages and then scale what's selling, but don't scale from, you know, 20 to a thousand yeah. scale from 20 to 40 and 40 to 80 and so on. Yeah. yeah so so your, your, you first, your first store, you might spend five or 600 bucks a month, uh, five or 600 bucks a month eventually, but like five or 600 bucks set aside to test through it. And with drops of a year to get sales relatively quickly. So like, um, it, it's not like it's not like a two month sales cycle. Well, you're, that's you're not like even though we're going to buy new items. items. Yeah, it's still it really is direct response because of the way we drive traffic. So it's from long tail keywords, you know, even though it's Google, it's from brand names, product names, SKU numbers, the people that are searching that know what they want. Then for anyone that doesn't know what PLAs look like, I mean, they see an image of the product you sell. They see the price from your website. They see your store name. They see free shipping if you offer that. So when they click that, if they search for the right thing, which you can control, that's a very good lead. And then we do some things, you know, to get them to buy sooner than later, some like conversion techniques that like literally most of our sales, they're going to occur within three to five days of someone finding us. So it's not like the payback or the, the return on ad spend happens a month from now or six months from now. It happens within a week. You know if your ads are working or not. And you just adjust from there. Uh, pull up the one, John, about the uh, competition in California. Someone had a question right there. Doug Hiddingson. Risk of buyer faces is the seller will start a competing business after they've sold. And to make this worse in California, as you, you may know, non-compete agreements are very weak, even when properly legally drafted. So there's like two questions there, right? So like one of the risks that a buyer faces is that the seller or other potential buyers that look to the business are going to copy or compete with that business right away. And the second piece is how do you protect yourself? Uh, how do you protect yourselves um, with contracts? So the first one I'll address is that one of the things we do at Empire of the Bristol, we have limited buyers looking at yeah. the businesses. So it doesn't mean that the seller won't go and copy you. It doesn't mean that one of those people won't go and copy you. It means that it's not a public marketplace where hundreds or a thousand people have viewed the niche and can then go out and copy it. So so it limits the, the potential copycats to a smaller group that are actually out there looking to buy. Now, one of the the, the, the things that uh, one of the reasons that a seller wouldn't be as interested in going and copying your business after they've sold it to you. Um, is that they would be banned from our marketplace. So if they're doing business with us multiple times, and that's common, I'd say, I don't know, less than 50%, but a fair portion of our sellers are repeat sellers. They wouldn't be able to sell their businesses with us again. So that'd be problematic. Yeah, and I think a, a lot of sellers, you know, I mean, Justin always talks about this. 
there, there's a lot of good people out there too. And while Doug, I understand you're trying to protect yourself and you should, um, you know, you should talk to your seller. And, and if you get the kind of feeling from him that, that he's the kind of guy who's going to backdoor you and, and replicate don't, don't you, then don't buy from him. Yeah, you, yeah. Get, you know, ask uh, around, ask for references, see if he's ever done business with anyone else. And if they, if he doesn't have that to say, then I would say that's a person you don't want to do business with. That's something I did. And like that, like when, like when I was in my negotiation process with the first round of stores, that was a big part of it. Trying to make sure like, you know, and I was the seller, but I wanted to make sure like when this guy bought, like there was going to be no like remorse almost on the other side too. And there are a lot of good people, but I think the reference point is a really good idea. If you feel anything a little weird, talk to some people, you know, and yeah, yeah, yeah. they'll put you at ease. The other thing, he mentioned like a non-compete in California. Well, to be honest, if you're buying an online business, it's not likely you're going to be dealing in the California market. You may be in California, but it doesn't mean that the, the person you're buying from or the person you're selling to is in California. In fact, it's very likely that they won't be. So the bigger problem is that, but it still raises the question, like you've got a Chinese national living in Australia, buying a business from an American living in you know, India. Well, what jurisdiction is it in? Um, how are you going to like enforce the contract? Where do you enforce it? Is it enforceable? These are all questions that are important. One of the things is if you're, if you're doing business like a five figure drop shipping or e-commerce sale, I mean, the truth is you're just not, you're not going to force it. They're not going to force it. It's not likely to happen. So, you know, it is an, as is you're not following up on anything. Now and, we're talking. And that's at, why it's important to get to know your seller and what, why are they selling this business? Are they selling this business to go into a new venture that's very similar to this venture? Yeah. Well, that should throw up some red flags for you, or, right? Or buy, or buy businesses where you know the earnings and the traffic yeah. have been verified. Or if you're a seller, putting yourself next to other businesses that have been verified and then are legitimate. Yeah. Now, if you're talking like a four or five, eight hundred thousand dollar, one point two million dollar sale, now we're talking enough dollars where it probably is worth not only having a contract uh, on, but it may be worth litigating if there were issues, if, if and, absolutely required. And, and a lot and of then people you're gonna want lock, to avoid And then, then you're going to lock down theaters. You're going to lock down uh, where any, you know, uh, arbitration may happen. And that's that's when it's going to start to get, you know, I think serious and, and involved in terms of... And, and, and Empire Flippers, we can help you navigate the non-disclosure part, or sorry, the, the non-compete part of any agreement. We have a lot of experience there. We've done things... 10 year non compete agreements in very specific keywords where the guy cannot produce another site that ranks for those particular keywords. And we've done very short non competes that are more blanket and say, like, you just can't compete in the fashion niche at all. Yeah, a lot of that's so going to depend depends. on the buyer and seller right. and kind of what they're looking to protect against and like what they need. So, and that's one of the reasons negotiation can get really tricky because someone's like a non compete. And they're like, they're in their heads are like, so I can't compete on Amazon ever. I can't build the, any other dropshipping store. Well, yeah. no, I'm not going to do that. Oh, yeah. And the deal could be lost right there. They're thinking I can't build a dropshipping store and I, I, I'm not going to agree to that. And they say no to the deal when they, the other person said, I don't want a dropshipping store in the chandelier niche. Right. Yeah, exactly. You know what I mean? So like that's people, how mine have always been. Like, we're not going to sell in this niche for X amount of years. We're not going to use these suppliers for X amount of years. It's not, we're not going to advertise on Google. Yeah. You know, you can do it. Yeah. Yes, yeah, specificity, especially if it's going to be a lot longer of a non-compete, you got to be very, very specific in the language that's in there. But we can help you negotiate that. All right, so, John, any other questions? Are we good? Yeah, yeah give us sure. one more. We're, we're, we're about to wrap this up. Let's do one more question. Uh, did uh, Doug Henson said, did I hear that right? 20 to 30 times cash flow. That must be per month. Yes. You might want to make that clear as most pricing on businesses on an annual EBITDA or cash flow. That's right, Doug. Uh, Twenty to thirty times monthly. monthly. We use yeah. a m monthly net, monthly multiple at Empire Flippers. Yes, monthly yeah. multiple. Yeah, it's funny. You know, uh, some people hear that and they go, "Oh my God, that's the, we're talking like valley numbers." No, no, no. It's monthly. Uh, you know, you know what's interesting though, Anton, about this this kind of industry, the buying and selling online business industry, is that you know, let's say two to three years or twenty to thirty times, pr pretty similar. Um, some people hear that they can sell their store at uh, 30x 30 times net monthly profit and they're like oh my god like that is i would never sell my store for that and others here and they're like oh my god please sign me up let me do it right away the buyers here that they would go i would never buy at 30x and others are like oh my god less mm -hmm. than three years cash flow i'll do that all day so it's just such a good sign that there's a market for this because people come into it with 
surprisingly, uh, like very, um, they're very adamant about their views on this. Have you noticed this? Like people are like, yeah. they come in, they're like, it would that business would never be worth thirty x. And someone else comes in and goes, you know, I would sell thirty x in a heartbeat if I could. Yeah. So like people are just very adamant about. It. And what's funny about that is you can't you can't have it one way without having the other. Right. So if you're like, um, no one's gonna buy uh, a business at thirty x, then we say, hey. Come sell your business with us because yeah. because we have people will buy it all day right. long. All day long will buy it by a 30X. So you can't, you know what I mean? You can't say one and not get the other. It's funny. Yeah, it, it, it is a strange thing. But there was another question, I think, John, about SOPs that I, I would like to address. Yeah, so Steve Appleton says, how important are SOPs? And this goes back to the work required that we were talking about before. It helps your multiple, it, it, um, makes it less risky for a buyer if you have SOPs yeah. in place. People in process, right? So if you've got process in place, it's going to help you get a better multiple. Yeah, I, I love this question, Steve. That's why I pointed it out. Um, I really like to see SOPs in place, especially on bigger businesses. Buyers find that extremely valuable. That documentation, that that hopefully not physical, don't print it out, save the trees. <laughs> but, you know, if, if you can... Uh, That's a little jab, man. <laughs> know, we're, talking, we're talking before the I show. Yeah, you're you printing stuff print out. Now, but I recycle. I I was a little like, jab, buddy. Just, just to circle back to the beginning. But yeah, no, uh, I mean, I think if you use something like Google Docs or we use Sweet Process, which I really love, uh, and have that documentation laid out beforehand so that the buyer, you can present it in a nice presentation so that his employees or the, or the existing employees can transition very easily to you. Um, yeah. That makes for a va more valuable business, a higher multiple, and a quicker sale, an easier sale. Yeah. And, and while you're running your business, it's going to make your life easier too. So do it before, you know, don't, don't wait till the last minute. Like, Oh, got to type something up because the site's for sale. Do it anyway. Get your site to scale up, make more money and then pass it all over when you're ready to cash out. All right, man, everyone on Facebook, you know, thank you so much for checking this out again. You know, it's Anton from dropship lifestyle. We've been friends for years, runs an amazing business, really helps people get into drop shipping. Again, Justin, Joe empire flippers. You can check us out if you're looking to potentially sell or buy an online business and buddy it's been so much fun doing this we should do it again i like i think it was you you uh you brought up the whiskey wednesday Love idea it. we might have to try to, to try to sneak I'm that down. in some down yeah, a little bar over there joe's got some water over here and he's like yeah, this is I'm, I'm dry man i'm dry yeah <laughs> next time all right buddy well good having you on thanks so much for coming on appreciate it all right, bye, -bye guys. everybody enjoy thailand bye everybody <laughs>